Um, I want to begin by talking a little bit about why international organization seems to be left out of most of the theories that you're probably uh, reading and studying at the moment. Uh, to me, international organization and particularly the UN uh, is really, uh, they're homeless institutions when it comes to IR theory. Uh, frankly, most of the people who do theory and most of the people who write about political science know very little about international institutions and are not terribly interested in learning much more. Uh, and most people who know about international institutions frankly don't know much about IR theory. Uh, maybe they should, but they don't seem to be too interested. Uh, and so if there's a conversation at all, it tends to be a, a, a dialogue of the, of the death. Now, uh, to me, these institutions not only are homeless in, in theory, but they're really quite unsinkable in practice. Uh, I won't sing the praises of most international institutions. Uh, most of the ones I know don't work particularly well. Uh, the bureaucracies are inefficient. They're nothing compared to Columbia's bureaucracies, of course, but they are quite inefficient. Uh, and uh, their delivery uh, is a sometimes thing. Uh, they tend to be relatively unaccountable. Uh, the only group I can think even less accountable probably would be uh, college professors uh, who are completely unaccountable. Uh, but um, nevertheless, these are not institutions I would put on any pedestal in terms of performance. Uh, but it does seem, despite that, that people keep coming back to them again and again and again. Now, not only are realists uh, dismissive uh, of international institutions, uh, which is always convenient to dismiss the things you don't know about, and assume if you don't know about things, they must not matter. But of course, the things that really, in the end, get us are the things that we haven't studied and don't know about. Uh, but not only the realists have a problem with them, but so do um, most liberals and, and many uh, uh, idealists, uh, because to them these institutions are continually disappointing. Uh, they're disappointing in part because they are based to a certain extent not only on law and principle, but also on power. Uh, those who only understand power don't understand law and principle, and those who only understand law and principle don't understand power. And it seems to me what we ought to be doing is seeing how these come together. Uh, and we ought to take more realistic uh, approaches to international uh, institutions. Now, uh, I was asked just before we started about why did uh, I suggest the readings uh, in the order uh, that uh, I put them. I put Mersheimer first, not only because he's a very distinguished political scientist, but his arguments are the most easiest to dismiss, uh, and so why not, why not start there? They're particularly easy when he's not in the room. Uh, it's mo most convenient. Uh, but it does seem to me uh, he begins with this assumption, as do most realists, uh, that because states create international institutions and because they largely control international institutions, then there's nothing interesting to study in and of these institutions. They're simply the product of national policy uh, and, and therefore bring very little uh, to the argument. Uh, now the Ian Hurd piece suggests that there are some pieces of sovereignty uh, that these institutions exercise uh, because they do have control over certain situations uh, and, and of course as a constructivist would, would argue they really do shape the values that states do bring uh, uh, to uh, foreign policy very often. Now clearly those who founded the UN were not simple-minded idealists. Uh, among them uh, was Joe Stalin. Uh, uh, there were people who obviously uh, founded these organizations for very hard-headed reasons to advance national interests. Uh, and if they had not done so, and if they not had created that kind of structure, we probably wouldn't have them around today. Uh, but it does seem to me they are firmly based uh, in real politique. Uh, they were not created in a very simple uh, meditation uh, uh, session out in, in uh, San Francisco. Uh, they were, in fact, very, very hard fought battles over how these institutions would work, uh, what the power relationships would be, both within each of the principal uh, organs and certainly uh, between them. Uh, for the P5, who are the conveners, and then adding France later, uh, clearly this is all about um, uh, into the future uh, perpetuating a wartime alliance. Uh, it was to create an oligopoly of, uh, oligopoly of power, uh, and they wanted to keep this uh, going, and they found a pretty good ways, a way to do it. Uh, but it does seem to me, uh, when you look at some of the statements of the time, they meld rather nicely the sort of realistic uh, and the idealistic. Um, Edward Statinius was the 
uh, U.S. foreign minister at the time. Uh, he was head of the U.S. delegation. This was widely regretted. He was someone who came from a business background, God forbid. Uh, someone who is known as being particularly pedestrian uh, in his thinking and in his speech. Uh, he and I have a lot in common. Uh, and uh, people said, my God, you know, he's going to have no, uh, no sense of leadership at all. Uh, but he said something at the time uh, of the charter, which I, I, I think is worth uh, thinking about a little bit. He said, the first function of the charter is moral and idealistic. The second, realistic and practical. Men and women who have lived through war are not ashamed, as other generations sometimes are, to declare the depth and the idealism of their attachment to the cause of peace. But neither are they ashamed to recognize the realities of force and power which war have forced them to see and endure. Um, as I'll talk about in a minute, it is indeed war that tends to produce international organization. And the bigger the war, the bigger the international organization. Now, Dag Hammarskjöld uh, gave a much uh, shorter and more famous rendition of this in 1954, which I'm sure most of you have heard, when he said the United Nations was not created in order to bring us heaven, but in order to save us from hell. Uh, if you work at the UN, you may not sure that's true. Uh, you may think, in fact, the bureaucracy was to send the International Civil, Civil Service to hell. But uh, nevertheless, it all depends uh, on one's definition, I suppose. Uh, now, if you look at the history of international organization going back a few years, uh, you look at the Thirty Years' War, a nasty war, uh, which produced, among other things, the Treaty of Westphalia uh, and the very uh, basis for the interstate system of non-intervention and, and the sense of sovereignty, which I'll talk about more later. Um, and really, that, in essence, provides the basis of interstate uh, organization. Uh, it also produced, uh, produced Hugo Grotius' ideas, that 17th century Dutch uh, legal scholar, uh, on just war doctrine and a more tame kind of relationship among states. Now, this worked for a while. Uh, and then we had, uh, of course, uh, the uh, Council of Europe uh, in the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, and a series of international institutions were created. Uh, most people forget that the 19th century creation of international institutions, in some ways, uh, was, was, in a functional way, uh, almost as broad as what we see now. Uh, not only did you have the Council of Europe, uh, you had the Elba and Rhine Commissions, you had the Universal Postal Union, uh, the International Telecommunications Union, groups that still exist today, uh, were founded way back then, the Interparliamentary Union, again still with us, uh, the ICRC, um, and, and uh, uh, some 30 very broad-based intergovernmental organizations dealing with functional kinds of issues. Uh, in terms of stopping disease, uh, around the world and various scourges, uh, you had dozens of organizations created just in the 19th century for that purpose alone. Uh, and at the end of the century, you had the Hague conferences, uh, in many ways uh, putting humanitarian law and arms control both on the map, uh, a time where you had uh, uh, major big bucks people like Carnegie uh, getting involved in international affairs. It's not only today. Uh, that you had this kind of uh, uh, independent influence. You had uh, hundreds of NGOs actively lobbying. Uh, again, it's not only today that we have these kinds of things. Uh, and you had a degree of interdependence in terms of trade uh, that is higher than we have today. So the theory was, okay, we'll work on legal arbitration, we'll work on all these functional uh, agencies, we'll work on trade, we'll tie countries in a way that they couldn't possibly go to war, uh, and of course, what happened, we had World War I. Uh, so what did World War I say? Okay, we had all this international organization, uh, we had all this trade, what did we get World War? So what do we need? We need more international organization. Uh, maybe it didn't work the first time, so we got the League. Uh, the League didn't work uh, perfectly wonderfully. A uh, terrific set of uh, functional institutions, a little less uh, effective on peace and security. Uh, and so what do we get? We get World War II. We get bigger organization, and then we get bigger wars, and then after that we get still bigger uh, organizations. Um, and so what happens after World War II? Uh, you'd think people despair, let's try something different in international law. International organization isn't working. Uh, so what do they do? They create yet a larger, more ambitious organization uh, in terms of the UN and the UN system and the Bretton Woods institutions. <laughs> a little worried right in and out here. Oh, I thought maybe I was supposed to phone in. I, I wasn't quite sure. 
<laughs> people usually say they prefer I phone in the, the lectures. It's much more pleasant that way. <laughs> then you can sort of imagine what the speaker is like, and you don't get all the dis disappointment. It's, 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 it's a lot like it's a lot like international institutions. There's a lot of feedback going on uh, all the time. Uh, you know, there's a lesson from all this. Never question the realists. They get back to you. They always get back to you, one way or the other. Uh, you know, if you're a constructivist, no one cares. You know, you have no relationship to power. If you're a realist, you know how to control things. Uh, so never, never question the realist. Anyway, uh, if you if you recall before the pleasant uh, interruption, um, I was talking about these cycles. You know, you get war, and then more organization, then you get more war, then you get more organization. You know, people never learn. Uh, and so, you know, you end with the Cold War. And so, after the Cold War, what do you get? A reinvigoration of international institutions, a huge surge in peacekeeping in the early 90s. Uh, you get probably more creation of international law uh, during the decade of the 90s than at any other point in, in human history. Um, and then what happens? Uh, then you have the war in Iraq. Okay? Uh, and the Secretary General himself uh, is fretting that the organization has become irrelevant. The big powers has gone, have gone around the Security Council, uh, and we're in big trouble. Uh, so what happens? Uh, before you know it, the big powers are back from the council. Uh, peacekeeping is going up again. The organization is being used uh, more than, than ever before. Now, I'm a little afraid to do this, but I actually have a couple of PowerPoint projections here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. Let's see. Hey. OK, we don't have sound, but we, we have a picture. So what, what, what more could we want? Uh, OK, uh, if you look at the number of Security Council resolutions and presidential statements, uh, as you see, the basic ten trend tend is, tendency is up, up, up. Uh, it suggests the Council is, is, fairly, is fairly busy. Uh, uh, you look at the number of Security Council meetings and consultations. This obviously is a fairly busy group. You look at the end of the Cold War, uh, with 55 formal meetings and, and 62 informal consultations. Uh, you look now, uh, last year we had almost 500. That's obviously more than one meeting a day. Uh, many meetings of the council now have four or five different issues going on at the same time. Uh, and this does not even count all those sort of non-meetings of the council where all the real work happens uh, because they happen in various missions and little informal, informal group, uh, groupings uh, where even the informal consultation room is too formal. Uh, so they go off in other places to do the work. So this is nonstop, uh, seven days a week, pretty much uh, 365 days a year, uh, morning, noon, and very often night. Now whether this is a good thing or not, uh, I'll leave to you. Uh, but uh, clearly, whoever says the council is going out of business, the UN is going out of business, isn't watching the numbers. Uh, now we, I think we have 19 uh, ongoing uh, peace operations. And I think if you look at the number of uh, mediation, <coughs> Uh, uh, state building kinds of exercises going on. Uh, there's something like 40 now at the present time. Uh, there are more peacekeepers deployed than ever by the UN, which doesn't count uh, the number deployed by NATO, the AU, and others. You put them together, uh, we probably have uh, at least 200,000 uh, uh, military forces deployed, not to mention all the civilians and others that go along with us. So obviously, uh, maybe this is not important, maybe it's irrelevant, maybe it can be dismissed, but uh, it is happening. Uh, now, uh, let me talk a little bit about Mike Lennon. Uh, why did I put Mike Lennon second? Because even though he's a good friend, he's also easy to, uh, easy to critique. I know you both read and memorized his piece, but just in case you didn't. Uh, he suggests that the Charter has gone the way of the 1928 Kellogg-Briand Pact. If you ever want to have some entertaining reading, uh, go back and read the uh, Senate debate about the Kellogg-Briand Pact and the various statements of the parties. Uh, all the parties basically said it, it would in no way inhibit their foreign policy or use of military force. Nevertheless, it was a monumental break, uh, breakthrough for international uh, peace and security, which I thought was a good thing. Okay, now he goes on and very much uh, echoes Coffee and on. I'm not sure whether uh, Coffee read his stuff or vice versa, uh, saying the council is ruptured, it's failed, uh, and it will not be resuscitated. Uh, and the regime on the non-use of force has collapsed. Um, and uh, basically no longer, no longer matters. Um, now, uh, going back to Mersheimer, uh, he argues, and I think it's an interesting argument, that institutions 
have mattered rather little historically. Uh, and the, what really is worrisome is that people think that international institutions matter. And he go, goes beyond that to say what's really terrible is that Americans have a particular weakness to believe that international law and international institutions matter. And the realists have proven that they don't. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, this could be very dangerous uh, for our foreign policy and, and understanding uh, of the world. Now, clearly, uh, uh, the American leadership uh, either has read Mersheimer and uh, uh, agree that in fact Americans are, are likely to, to fall into this trap and they too have fallen into this trap uh, because if you look at uh, the U.S. activity uh, in the Security Council and elsewhere in the U.N., I would argue that it's at an all-time high. Uh, the U.S. is more active trying to get more things done uh, in the Council than, than ever before. Uh, and what is striking is that it's not just marginal questions of let's say a, an isolated conflict in one part uh, of Africa or another. But in fact, the U.S. is bringing its major uh, international security concerns to the Security Council. Uh, take uh, the question of, of uh, Iran, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, Korea, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, terrorism. Uh, now, it's not saying that the U.S. only uses the Council. Obviously, it has a lot of other tools. But it keeps going back on things that really are quite central. Uh, uh, to, its, to its international uh, security uh, interests. Now, it could be argued that this is only because it's a facade uh, and that because groups in the public care about these institutions or have these silly idealistic viewpoints that the uh, leaders are, are bending to this. Uh, but it really doesn't matter because they don't do anything that, that really is of importance there. And then I think one has to ask, why is it over the course of an administration uh, they become more and more enamored of using uh, the UN as an institution. Uh, I remember when Ronald Reagan was, was president, long before any of you were born, of course, um, and I was at that time ahead of the United Nations Association in this country, and we were a little worried because uh, Congress had said some years back we were supposed to have a, a UN Day celebration uh, October 24th. I assume you all paused last week on October 24th uh, for, for UN Day, I, I assume that. The whole place was, was draped in light blue. Uh, and, and it's convenient that Columbia light blue and UN light blue are almost identical. Uh, and I assume the whole place wasn't draped in black as when Ahmadinejad spoke here. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, National UN Day, we were supposed to lead the celebration around the country and all the main mayors and the big cities and all the governors were supposed to appoint a UN Day chairman. And of the 50 uh, governors, only one refused to appoint a UN Day chairman. He, of course, being Ronald Reagan in California. So we thought this was not a promising start uh, when he came to the UN uh, the first time uh, after becoming president. But what is striking, if you look at the changing nature of both the US engagement to the UN uh, over his tenure and his words uh, on this annual uh, trip uh, to the General Assembly, uh, his final speech is one of the closest, uh, most personal tributes to the UN that you're going to find that he had looked forward every year to this uh, journey up to New York and speaking to all his friends in the assembly and this was uh, uh, so important uh, to the U.S. Uh, he, he also made the effort to start paying off the dues. Uh, some minor reforms were made in the U.N. and he decided these were earth shaking and the whole U.N. had turned around and all of a sudden it was, it was a hunky-dory body. Well, we haven't seen quite the same metamorphosis with George W. but he certainly moved in that direction a good deal from the days when he was totally dismissive of the organization uh, and now is only occasionally so. Uh, so, you know, there does seem to be something of a learning process over time and if it was only a facade, uh, you wouldn't bring your major issues and you wouldn't over time uh, seem to have this kind of a, kind of a learning process. Now, um, you know, I think the realists do have a point. Uh, as I said beginning, they, they point out that these institutions are run by states and, and power matters a great deal. Uh, but what they fail to tell us is where national interests come from. Uh, who defines national interest? Uh, you know, we wouldn't have elections, we wouldn't have debates uh, if in fact it was intuitively obvious that there is a set of three, four interests, we know what the hierarchy is, and we know what to do about it. Uh, even if we agree on what the interests are, it doesn't tell us what kind of policy one pursues to forward those interests. Uh, and it does seem to me that all of that revolves a great deal around values. Uh, 
uh, around values and perceptions and around the consideration of what options uh, we might have. And this, I think, very importantly, is where uh, constructivism comes in. It's where Martha Finnemar's uh, piece comes in uh, and where uh, humanitarian and human rights issues uh, enter uh, into, the, into the fray. Now, I'd like to say a few words uh, about the Security Council. Actually, quite a few words. Um, now, as I pointed out, the Council is very active. Uh, whether, whether the Council is effective or not, uh, I leave it to you to think about. Uh, but it is worth looking at the Human Security Report, and uh, I hope you read that one at least, or the summary of it, because it is very short and simple. Uh, it's worth remembering that whatever the problems are in the world, uh, that in fact there's been an enormous amount of progress. Uh, the number of wars between states uh, down strikingly since the end of the Cold War. The number of wars within states uh, down strikingly since the end of the Cold War. The number of casualties from war again down. Uh, the number of refugees down a lot. Now the number of internally displaced people uh, a little harder to tell but at least doesn't appear to be going up dramatically despite problems in various places. Uh, I was in uh, Bogota over the weekend and um, uh, talking to the human rights and, and uh, 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 refugee people for the UN and you know they have the second largest group of IDPs in the world. Uh, obviously there are spots where the problems have not gone away but overall the trend lines are very encouraging just as uh, most of the economic trend lines are relatively encouraging uh, with rates of economic growth up much more rapidly in developing than developed countries uh, with infant mortality down, with life expectancy up uh, with the, the uh, number of, of people uh, uh, in, in total poverty down quite considerably, far higher than one ever would want, but the overall trend lines are going in the right direction. Uh, so there might actually be some evidence that international institutions uh, might be, be helping a bit, uh, at least in, in the aggregate. Now, uh, there's five problems I'd like to, to point out uh, with the council that are sort of worrisome uh, because let's say that it's true that there is this basic urge for multilateral cooperation. Uh, there is this tendency among even policymakers to learn over time and try to use international institutions more. Um, are these institutions actually ready? Uh, are they capable? Uh, can they absorb uh, all the new business that they're getting? Uh, and there's five uh, worries I'd like to, to talk about a little bit now. Um, one uh, is the range of issues being undertaken uh, by the council. Um, now this is uh, a chart I did up a couple years ago for a book that Michael Dora and I did on compliance with international law. And I put forward there a little mini theory, uh, not only about compliance, but the commitment to ensuring compliance to international law. And the argument was basically that, you know, law is not law is not law and uh, that the international uh, uh, environment is so different than the domestic ones that the analogies don't work very well uh, back and forth. Now, it seemed to me if you looked at various spheres of international law uh, and activity, you could roughly uh, put them in three large clusters. Um, one where there's a rather low commitment to compliance and enforcement are those dealing with human interests, naturally. Uh, things like human rights, humanitarian concerns, democratic practices, and, and the like. Uh, in the middle are sort of transnational interests. Those in which everyone is responsible and so no one is responsible uh, and, and where you have obviously fundamental uh, questions of, of, of who's going to take the burden and who's going to take the lead. Uh, environment, global commons, uh, issues like health, narcotics, crime, uh, and local conflict. Conflict in which the major powers don't have a, a deep uh, interest. Uh, and I'd include in that things like landmines and, and small arms, light weapons, um, uh, efforts at reduction. Uh, things that are not going to fundamentally affect uh, the overall strategic balance in any particular way. So these are the areas actually where the UN tends to be deeply involved as well as, as many of those on, on the left side of the chart. Uh, on, on human interests. And then you get to those uh, on, on the right side, the core national interests. Uh, and there I put physical uh, security, things like you know, WMD, aggression, terrorism, 
and importantly, trade issues, uh, trade, finance, economic prosperity. The things that either win or lose votes and therefore matter, um, or that have to do with, with national security and, and national survival. Now, what you end up seeing in terms of compliance mechanisms, on the left, uh, you have a lot of monitoring, fact-finding, reporting, um, uh, some incentives, uh, some efforts at capacity building, uh, public diplomacy, very little in terms of uh, sanctions, uh, negative kinds of, kinds of enforcement. Uh, and most of the responses tend to be rather ad hoc by states. Okay, in the middle, the compliance mechanisms tend to be very articulated, uh, quite, quite ambitious. Um, but they're very hev heavily dependent on, on cooperative mechanisms of one sort or another, which is where the UN tends to come, come into. Uh, again, the tools monitoring, fact-finding, reporting, capacity building, judicial processes, um, and, and some incentives and, and the like and a big role for, for private organizations, uh, NGOs, and, and whatever. Uh, but what you end up seeing in those treaties, very big sections on, on compliance and verification, a lot of mechanisms, a lot of bureaucracies, and rather little national power and effort behind them. So let's leave it to the UN, let's l leave it to uh, an international organization to do something about it. And you go on the right, the core national interests, uh, those tend to be very heavily dependent on reciprocity, on power. I would include the WTO, uh, in that certainly most arms control uh, east of an east-west variety um, and rather little articulation of institutional uh, formats because you don't need it uh, because you have the power uh, to, to deal with it uh, instead. Um, and now uh, looking at the bottom, very different domestic constituencies. Human interests broad but thin, uh, advocacy groups uh, but some real skeptics uh, as well who sort of pull it down. Uh, in the middle, very broad uh, constituencies uh, and very well um, focused advocacy NGOs, epistemic communities uh, and the like. Uh, but probably big splits uh, in parliaments and, and uh, 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 quite different viewpoints as to whether they are in the national interest or not. And then on the right, uh, you tend to have a general consensus nationally. Uh, and those who attend Columbia University uh, are in the small minority who dissent, uh, and the rest of the country uh, tends to be, be more supportive. Uh, and the dissenters probably feel they pay a price uh, uh, in terms of, of their dissent. Okay, now why did I raise all of this other than to, to, uh, to point to this nifty little piece? Um, the problem here uh, for the Security Council, it seems to me, is that today it's in all three of these areas. Uh, the Council is dealing with the human interests, uh, human rights protection issues, humanitarian, uh, and heavily with dem democratic practices, state building, and the rest. Uh, and much more so in the last 10 years or so. Uh, it's quite heavily involved in uh, the middle kinds of issues, uh, thematic issues in, in many ways. Uh, and more so, particularly in, in, in recent years, including uh, in the environment issues of this sort. Uh, and of course, a number of the core national interests now are coming before the, the, uh, the council, like, like terrorism uh, and WMD, nonproliferation, these kinds of issues. So in a way, this is all good news, and it's among the reasons why the council is so active. It's trying to do everything in all these areas. The problem is the national commitment to back these up varies enormously uh, from one area to the other. Uh, and therefore, the council ends up uh, with a very mottled uh, kind of an agenda, agenda and very, very uneven performance. Uh, it looks like a group that's trying to be all things uh, to all people. Uh, when it deals with many of the issues in the middle, uh, it's accused of encroachment vis-a-vis uh, -vis the General Assembly. Uh, and as it defines uh, security broader and broader, uh, this tends to be uh, a, a, a very difficult uh, problem for it. Uh, it gets involved in a lot of, of issues here that it doesn't have much control over. And it doesn't have the, the, the uh, institutional capacity to deal with very effectively. And those on the right, uh, nonproliferation, counterterrorism, uh, tend to be rather controversial among the member states. Uh, the big powers tend to favor them, uh, at least the Western big powers, uh, and some of the others uh, are rather worried. Uh, so you have. Uh, a very difficult problem, uh, sort of the image of the council. 
Uh, it's not just peacekeeping anymore. It's a lot of different kinds of things. Now, the second problem that I see with the council these days um, is what I'd call the tip of the iceberg problem. Uh, what we see is that um, uh, group uh, meeting around the horseshoe table in the Security Council chamber. Uh, we tend to focus on the 15. We tend to focus on, on the resolutions. Uh, and what we don't see is all of the uh, growing bureaucracy, the growing institutionalization uh, uh, under that in the council. Let me skip here a couple. Yeah, sort of out of order. Here we are. Um, subsidiary bodies uh, of the Security Council. Now, depending how you count, there are approximately 28 uh, at, at this moment. Almost all of them are chaired by non-permanent members. Uh, rarely does a permanent member chair any of these. So on the one hand, it gives the 10 non-permanent members a lot of stuff to do, and some of it's relatively important stuff. On the other hand, they feel they're so tied up running all these uh, uh, working groups and committees that they don't have, uh, they're, they're spread very thin. And it's all sort of a ruse to, to make sure that they don't have much influence in the council. Uh, but these are not um, uh, some of these uh, unimportant uh, activities uh, on, the part of the, on the part of the council. Uh, you see these on sanctions and similar matters. We still have a dozen of those. It changes, obviously, when a sanction regime is lifted. But each new sanction regime uh, normally has its own, co its own committee. Uh, and the committees um, uh, normally operate by consensus. So it's one nation, one vote. So the good news is that everyone's got a veto. You know, not only five, it's, it's, it's uh, in, in equity, you have 15 countries with vetoes. So of course, it's very hard to, to, to move along on many of these. Uh, people sometimes forget uh, that the ad hoc tribunals uh, are under the council, uh, Yugoslavia, uh, Rwanda, uh, whatever. Uh, and there's a lot of working groups. And many of these working groups deal with thematic kinds of issues um, and sometimes uh, trouble countries in, in, the, uh, in the assembly because of encroachment. Now, what you have is a number of these, particularly those on counterterrorism, have their own staffs, which are not well integrated into the regular secretariat. Uh, and so the Security Council not only has these 28 subsidiary bodies, many of them have their own experts groups, uh, many have uh, their own regular staff, uh, and their, their, their functions are spread uh, around the organization and all the way from uh, Vienna uh, to Geneva uh, to, to, to New York. Okay, so you've got a growing bureaucracy and you have no real uh, history or, or uh, institutional arrangements for handling a growing bureaucracy. Now, fourth, not unrelated to that, the council really has become an operational body, uh, in many ways operating in the field uh, itself. The council on a, on a fairly regular basis now takes missions out to the field. Uh, as you all will have remembered from the charter, the council doesn't have to meet in New York all the time. So it sometimes meets in other places. It has its own uh, staff and going out to various places to see what's going on. And, and very often, uh, subgroups of the council uh, would go out as well. Uh, in addition, there are a lot of new tools uh, as part of this. Uh, uh, questions of reporting, uh, questions of, uh, of uh, uh, setting up various kind of monitoring mechanisms uh, under the council itself. Uh, so it's changing from a group that sort of sits around a table and votes to the group that's very actively involved uh, in, in the running of the UN's field operations uh, in and of themselves. Now, finally, the fifth one, and I'm going to spend some time on this one, is a question of sovereignty. Um, now, to me, this is not an insurmountable problem. And it frankly has not been for the council as it goes about its work. But over time, as the council's work becomes more and more intrusive, more and more operational, uh, it is something that causes pause for a lot of member states. Now, if you look at the charter, there's a lot of things assigned to the organization that are inherently very intrusive, uh, that can't be solved simply through international negotiation. Uh, and some of these uh, are given to the council to deal with, even under the charter. Uh, you all, of course, have memorized Article 34. Uh, Article 34 of the charter uh, gives the council the right and responsibility to investigate, including within states, uh, matters which it deems not are necessarily a threat to international peace and security uh, or any breach of, 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 of security, uh, 
Uh, instead, things that might lead to trouble that might lead eventually to something that they might have to look at under Chapter 7 or, or elsewhere. It's really a wide open the way it's written un under 34. Uh, so now the council going out to the field and doing investigations and whatever really is very consistent with Article 34, though, though it's, rarely, it's rarely cited. Um, you look at uh, issues such as um, uh, counterterrorism. How do you deal with counterterrorism in a way that's not intrusive? Now, 1373, uh, the unanimous resolution two and a half weeks after 9-11, is rather sweeping, and there is some pushback on it, uh, dealing first and foremost with the financing of terrorism, but also the movement of terrorists, the sheltering of terrorists, uh, aiding and abetting one way and, or the other. And again, it's asking member states to report. And then when they report, they get evaluated, and then they ask to report again. And then other groups like 1540 on, on, on weapons of, of mass destruction and terrorism, again, reporting and, and what are you doing to, to, to try to, to improve your efforts. Uh, a lot of uh, the council is very deeply involved in now on capacity building within states. Uh, for example, what are you doing in terms of legislation to deal with terrorism and nonproliferation? Uh, what are you doing with uh, policing your borders? Uh, what are you doing in terms of the flow of money and, and tracking the flow of money? Uh, and so the council is getting involved in, in order to try to deal with, with uh, terrorism, obviously, in a preventive fashion and not after the fact, in a way which is inherently intrusive. Uh, the same is obviously true with nonproliferation. Uh, how do you deal with the threat of the acquisition uh, of nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons if you're not intrusive? Uh, each of those three conventions, while not obviously council conventions, refer back one way or the other to the council ultimately uh, for, for enforcement purposes. Um, and finally, uh, we have the whole humanitarian area uh, and the responsibility to protect. Uh, this one obviously I feel fairly passionate about and I think the good news is that the Secretary General does as well. Uh, now, I always assumed that states were formed, and I think I learned some of that in this class, uh, in part to provide protection to people. Uh, people, groups, tribes, whatever, would come together uh, in some kind of a collective uh, for their, their collective security. Uh, that this was a f fundamental purpose of the state. Uh, and that over time, uh, states have been quite ready to see their sovereignty in hundreds of ways all the time. Uh, we see very few complaints uh, from states that in the development efforts of the UN are infringing upon their sovereignty. Now and then you have complaints, but by and large they welcome that. Uh, you see very few complaints that trade relationships are infringing upon one's sovereignty. Yet clearly they do, uh, particularly these trade plus kinds of, kinds of uh, relationships that we have now. Big states, small states, they all sign thousands and thousands of agreements with other states. If sovereignty is the freedom of choice, each of these in some ways impinge upon your freedom of choice and the state makes the choice that they're better off uh, by doing this than not doing this. I mean, quite frankly, uh, if you look at the services the states are required to uh, be viable vis-a-vis uh, -vis their citizens, uh, very few of them can the state, man any state, manage on its own. Uh, there's something that I would call the sovereignty gap. The gap between what states are required to do uh, simply to be viable vis-a-vis -vis their citizens and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the responsibilities of statehood and what they can deliver on their own. Uh, most of the things that states have to deliver, they need cooperation of other states uh, one way or the other. Uh, what can you do about environmental issues uh, if you don't deal with neighbors and others? Uh, what can you do about disease if you don't deal with neighbors? What do you do about narco-trafficking? Uh, what do you do about organized crime? Uh, what do you do about finance and commerce? Uh, what do you do about security? I mean, no state is secure without the cooperation of others. And when you live in an era of nuclear weapons, you live in an era of intercontinental, uh, intercontinental delivery, you live in an era of, of uh, terrorism, uh, how can you say that you are a target? in terms of security. So it really is only a question of where you cede your sovereignty. Uh, and it's always been my feeling that what international organizations do, and some extent international law as well, is to allow the internet, interstate system to survive. Uh, international organizations are not the enemy of sovereignty. They're what allow sovereignty to persist. They're not the enemies of states. They're the friends of states. Uh, the Secretary General has argued at various points that the UN is highly dependent on having strong 
independent states. Uh, because the UN and international institutions cannot be effective, they don't have the capacity unless the states within them are strong uh, and independent. Uh, the problems that the UN faces constantly are with weak states uh, or failing states and they take up an inordinate amount of time of the organization. Um, and so the strength of states is not an enemy in my view uh, and sovereignty is not an enemy to effective international organization. Uh, in fact, it's a requirement for it. Uh, just as the interstate system can't survive, uh, unless you have effective international law and organization. And it seems to me even very strong states uh, come to understand that. And the very weakest states are those that have not learned to understand that. Uh, you look at the North Koreas, the Myanmars of the world, there are not very many of them. Uh, there are states who have tried to be relatively autarkic, and you look at them compared to all of their neighbors, they're not going in the same direction. Uh, so to say that sovereignty is somehow all of a sudden a barrier when it comes to human rights and humanitarian a treatment of, of, of populations seems to me is extraordinarily artificial. Um, and that in fact uh, many, of the tree, many of the countries who raise these questions have long been parties uh, to any number of, of human rights uh, conventions. Uh, so in recent years this has been put in different ways. Um, obviously Kofi Annan, particularly in, in 98 and 99, gave a number of very important speeches about humanitarian intervention. And the dilemma about whether it's better to sit by or whether it's better to move forward, including in military terms, uh, even if you do not have unanimity in the council or at least uh, the necessary nine votes and, and the votes of the five. Uh, is a Kosovo kosher or not, in essence, uh, uh, in that kind of regard? And what do you do if you have another Rwanda, uh, but Rwanda happens to be on the council and there happen to be one or two big states that don't want to move? Uh, is it the moral thing to do? Is it the legal thing to do? Is it the appropriate thing to do uh, to stand by uh, while, one, while one waits? Uh, now, uh, a couple of years ago, as many of you I'm sure have seen, uh, the Canadians put together, and I'm going the right way, imagine that, uh, the report put together the International Commission, Commission on Intervention and, and State Sovereignty. I'm sure many of you are very, very familiar with it. Um, I'd like to run through a couple of the recommendations uh, and raise some questions about them. Talk very briefly about the uh, 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 outcome document of the uh, Global Summit of two years ago, uh, which um, then accepted the, the responsibility to protect. Uh, now, principles for uh, military uh, intervention. Now, most of these are drawn from uh, the Just War Doctrine. Most of these are not terribly new, and most of these are not uh, terribly controversial. Uh, but I think some of these things are, are worth asking some questions about. Uh, the very first one on the just cause threshold, um, it, it refer, refers to serious and irreparable harm, uh, I don't think that's a legal standard, but anyway, occurring to human beings, or imminently likely to occur. Well, one of the biggest problems is how do we know what's imminently likely to occur? And if it's that imminent, is it too late to really do preventive action uh, to begin with? If it's going to happen tomorrow, maybe we've missed the, 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 the uh, boat. Uh, under that is point A, large-scale loss of life actual apprehended. Well, have we had major wars or civil wars that didn't have a large-scale loss of life? Uh, is that a useful standard or not? Um, again, these are not legal, legal standards. Uh, the question of neglect, uh, the question of failure to act, uh, even if it is not intentional. Uh, the suggestion here is that state neglect or inability to act or a failed state situation uh, is sufficient justification uh, for the international community to act. Uh, again, uh, something that's not so easy to do uh, and sort out in, in practice. Now the precautionary principles. These are clearly uh, the just war doctrine in a, in a new guise. The first one, right intention. I guess it's better than wrong than, it's better than wrong intention. I don't, whether it's better than left intention, I guess, is, is, is a political question. But in any case, uh, right intention is better assured with multilateral operations. That's probably true. But does it actually coincide with military realities in terms of effectiveness? 
uh, are multilateral operations usually more effective actually on the ground or not? Uh, now, if it's a peace operation in a, in a static situation, uh, uh, probably for political reasons, uh, it makes good sense. But if you're actually intervening to protect people in a time of imminent danger, in a time of, of, of conflict, uh, is multilateralism always a virtue other than the political correctness of it? Uh, look at Darfur right now. Now, the Sudanese government has taken the politically correct position, uh, which is that the peacekeepers ought to be, ought to be all African. This is an African situation after all, and we don't want uh, countries from the north that might have a uh, uh, bias of one sort or another uh, to, uh, to send their soldiers. But also it might be that the politically correct solution is in part because the AU uh, force will not have any attack helicopters uh, or other means of moving quickly from place to place, uh, and as we've seen recently, are often victims themselves uh, in, in some of these cases. So. Uh, you know, one might ask, yes, right, intention is great, multilateralism is great, but uh, is it always most effective? Now, the second one, last resort, uh, I must say gives me some, some pause. And I say this as a, as a, a college professor, not as a uh, sometime advisor at the UN, because I'm not sure this is exactly my position, be a UN position. But uh, for the sake of academic argument, uh, let's look at last resort. Uh, military intervention can only be justified when every non-military option has been explored. What does that mean? Every other option has been explored. Now, if I was a perpetrator on the other side, and I saw that the intent of those who might do something about this was to look at absolutely every other option they could possibly imagine, and if nothing works and everything has been exhausted, uh, then, yeah, then we might think of getting tough. Well, you know, one, I think I'd have a lot of time to do what I wanted to do, get rid of the people I wanted to get rid of and whatever. Uh, and two, I think I would question the uh, commitment of those uh, who, who might get involved. Um, and quite frankly, is this consistent with the UN Charter? I would argue it's not. Now, many secretaries general have said uh, that the use of force should always be the last resort. So it's almost gospel in the institution. So this is only an academic opinion, of course. But if you look back at San Francisco, uh, there was a debate about Article 42 uh, on the use of, of, of force. And the debate wasn't that it was going to be too often and too rapid, but quite the opposite, that it wasn't going to happen. And who wanted uh, the wording of the charter in 42 to be more open uh, to military action? It wasn't the big military powers. In fact, the draft produced uh, by the U.S. and, and, and uh, put forward from, from Dumbarton Oaks um, actually uh, said that uh, uh, military force would be used uh, when other measures, as in 41 uh, on sanctions, have proved to be inadequate. So the U.S. went sort of halfway towards this you know, last resort. And it was the Canadians, you know, the warlike Canadians, the big dominant superpower, uh, that came and said, no, 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 wait a minute. This is not what many of us want. Uh, we need to know that the council is going to be there uh, when we need it to be. And so they suggested that the words be added, uh, uh, that the council considers that Article 41 measures would be or have proved to be inadequate. So the council can make the judgment that down the road, uh, other things are not going to be enough. So we have to act more, more rapidly. Okay, now, uh, point C, proportional means. I mean, how can you be against proportional means? Uh, of course we should be proportional. You know, I'm not going to argue for disproportionate means. Um, it'd be sort of fun to, but I don't think it, it probably would be the best, best, best uh, argument. So let me instead look at the wording here. The scale, duration, and intensity of the planned military intervention should be the minimum necessary. Okay. Why not? But how do you know what's going to be the minimum necessary? Now, military planning traditionally uh, has been based on worst case reasoning or something close to it. Sometimes it may get us in trouble. Uh, but the assumption is you should have some redundancy because you don't know what is the minimum necessary. You don't know when things could escalate. You don't know when things could go badly. You don't know when things uh, aren't going to work out the way that you want. Uh, and in fact, I would argue that very often, in historically, uh, the greater and, and more decisive use of force 
has actually saved lives, uh, particularly civilian lives. Now, it's not always true, obviously. It depends how, how you use force. Uh, but if you're doing it step by step by step by step, maybe, one, it gives the other side time to react, and two, uh, it doesn't work so well uh, in terms of convincing them of your seriousness. And we see places, I, I hate to mention Iraq, uh, now, yes, I don't think many people in this room thought that we should have gone in Iraq, and I didn't think we should have either militarily, uh, but if one was to do it, it probably would have made sense to do it with a lot larger force uh, to prevent a lot of the things that have happened since that time, uh, and that going in with the minimum necessary uh, actually was, was much more uh, the, the point of view of the Secretary of Defense, uh, who now we think perhaps had it wrong. Okay, third, um, what about the show of force? Not really anything here about the show of force. Uh, somehow threatening the use of force. What about a deterrent? You know, maybe if you have an effective deterrent, you don't actually have to use it at all. Uh, where does deterrence fit under this? I don't know. I don't think saying that if we have to, as last resort, use the minimum, you know, is really a very effective deterrent because uh, you're just convincing them that you're not serious uh, about going forward. So, you know, I think uh, there are maybe humanitarian cases where you could have a display of force, a threat of force, a show of force, uh, which might, might make some difference to the parties. Uh, in that regard, what about a preventive deployment? You know, you see things are starting to go the wrong direction one way or the other, and you put some forces in a preventive mode. Now, it's been done a couple times, um, uh, not in the humanitarian situation, uh, but in, in, in Macedonia, for example, and it worked quite well. Uh, now, finally, I think it's worth noting that, again, I don't think that any of this is contrary to the Charter in, in, in C, but none of this kind of wording is in the Charter. Nowhere where you find uh, the minimum, proportional, you know, reasonable, step-by-step, -step, any of that sort of thing. Because those countries had just come from war. And smaller countries, particularly those that had been overrun, uh, wanted to be sure that this council would be as... Uh, quick to respond as possible, which is among the reasons why they objected to the veto. They objected to the veto in part because it was inequitable, but primarily because it was going to make it harder for the Council to respond. They had less reason to be assured that multilateral action might actually be there. Uh, okay, now let's go on to the, the next one on, on right authority. Uh, there is no better or more appropriate body than the United Nations Security Council to authorize military intervention for human protection purposes. I mean, I don't. I don't at least I couldn't disagree with that. Um, but it's interesting. Uh, when this, these same sets of principles were taken up by the high-level panel that the Secretary General had set up on, on challenges, uh, uh, threats, challenges, and change, uh, it was tied to a, what proved to be an unattainable expansion of the Security Council. Uh, the argument the Security Council was not legitimate unless it was larger and had a, a new cast of characters added to it, and also uh, asking the P5 to pledge not to use their veto in the case of humanitarian uh, emergencies. Uh, so on the one hand, they say, okay, the council is the best body, but we really sort of doubt its, its le legitimacy. Um, now, under B, uh, the Secretary General on Article 99, again, no problem with that, but we should remember that it's very, very rarely used, uh, in part because the Secretary General doesn't really have to use it because the council already is apprised of, of all these kinds of things. And there's an ongoing dialogue between the Secretariat uh, and the council. Uh, now, principles, uh, point D, uh, again, the, the five should not use their veto power in these kinds of cases. <coughs> Fine, as I think I argued in my piece that, that you may or may not have read, you know, the, the council has never accepted any guidelines, any standard uh, for its decisions. Uh, there are a lot of discussions in San Francisco about this. They're all rejected. The council was to be a political body. Uh, among other things, it's, it was not to defend or enforce any particular treaty uh, provisions. They were all left outside. The council was to decide on a political basis uh, when and how it was going to use uh, its powers under Chapter 7. And it's interesting, when in the um, summit two years ago, the, the largest gathering of, of heads of state and government in history, when the R2P paragraphs, which we'll look at in a minute, were adopted, uh, the last state to come aboard was India. Uh, 
And uh, what some of, them, some of the Indian diplomats have said to me is, that, look, we're great friends to R2P and humanitarian protection, but we don't think it should be done unless there's a restriction on the use of the veto. It might have been a mere coincidence that at the same time it was trying to get a permanent seat on the council and that these issues all got tied up together. Uh, but um, I don't think we're going to see them agree to this soon, but it would be a nice thing uh, if, they, if they would. Subsequent authorization from the Security Council. That obviously is contrary to Article 53 uh, when such authorization has to be sought uh, uh, beforehand. Now finally, uh, in, in point F there, uh, it seems to me uh, it's somewhat less than a legal term. Responsibility to protect in conscience-shocking situations crying out for action. You know, that sounds like a, like a media uh, definition. You know, if, if we're really shocked and if we happen to see it on TV, uh, then we should act. Uh, if the cameras aren't there and therefore uh, our conscience is not uh, there, therefore we don't need to. Um, and just one final point. Um, uh, under operational principles, the point C, acceptance of limitations, incrementalism and gradualism in the application of force. Again, I think that only is giving those committing atrocity more time and, and less, less to worry about. Now, what do they do at the, uh, uh, with the outcome document? I got it here somewhere. There you go. Okay. Uh, two paragraphs on, on R2P. Now, some people call it R2P light because of the caveats in it. But I think it's actually not, not a bad basis on, on which to act. Uh, now, here, you know, they're not talking about consciousness raising or anything of this sort. They're talking about four kinds of crimes. Protect population of genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. Nothing about suffering serious harm, nothing about our being shocked about it or anything of this sort. Four crimes. Now, ethnic cleansing is not well established in international law. The others are. War crimes, quite frankly, could be a little problematic. Uh, you know, an individual act by a soldier somewhere, uh, that could be a little bit tough. Genocide, very well established, obviously, uh, in international law. Crimes against humanity, uh, well established as well. Now, paragraph 138, in some ways it, it, it restates um, what countries have signed up for under human rights treaties, but I think it's important uh, the way it's, 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 it's put. One, uh, it stresses prevention. Two, it includes incitement. Uh, incitement is also not allowed, very important. And then the, the critical sentence in the middle of 138 there, we accept that responsibility and will act in accordance with it. So the pledge, at least, is unambiguous. The action, obviously, may be something less. Uh, and then the international community should encourage and help states to exercise responsibility and support the UN in establishing early warning capability. As far as I can recall, I only remember about 30, 35 years of discussion of establishing effective early warning. So it's been around a little while. But nevertheless, uh, uh, this goes on a bit more. Now, 139, most people point to as what is really rather new. Uh, that not only does the individual state have the responsibility, uh, but the international community also has a responsibility. The international community obviously is not party to these various uh, conventions. Uh, it has responsibility both under 6 and 8, diplomatic, humanitarian, peaceful um, means to protect populations. Uh, and uh, this is the pledge, the second pledge. In this context, we are prepared to take collective action in a timely and decisive manner through the Security Council in accordance with the Charter, including Chapter 7, case by case, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, should peaceful means be inadequate, sort of a, not quite 42, but something a little like it, and national authorities manifestly fail to protect their populations from these four crimes. And then it goes on about the General Assembly, and importantly at the bottom, to helping states build a capacity to protect uh, and to assist those that are under stress before crises and conflicts break out. Now, uh, this is not everything that one might have wanted, uh, but it seems to me it goes a very long way. And it provides some very interesting openings, including openings to sovereignty. How do you do capacity building without doing it in a very intrusive kind of a way? Uh, how do you go in and assist states on questions like incitement? Uh, how do you help states uh, build in the barriers uh, so they don't take these kinds of paths. Um, in the last two years since uh, this document was, was uh, 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 accepted by all the heads of state and government, there's been a lot of backsliding. Uh, there's been some buyer's remorse on the part of some states uh, 
uh, as if they didn't know what they're signing up for. It's worth remembering in that regard, one, that uh, there are very long, difficult uh, uh, negotiations that led to this. And also that important parts of this outcome document were dropped out entirely because they couldn't find agreement. All the stuff in disarmament, nonproliferation, uh, et cetera, were all dropped out of it. So the fact that this survived, uh, I think, is in and of itself quite significant. Um, and unfortunately, much of the debate publicly in the last two years has been about the use of force. Even the emphasis by the uh, International Commission on rules for the use of force made it sound as if R2P was all about the use of force. Even though the report itself uh, had a lot of good things to say about prevention and said that was, was, was step number one. Uh, so now we have to figure out, and I guess this is uh, where I'm supposed to take the lead, in how one uh, implements this. Uh, in part, how does one rebuild member state support? Uh, two, uh, how does one straighten out the conceptual side about what R2P does and does not mean? Uh, you know, some people have said it should be about everything from global warming uh, to um, uh, to HIV AIDS, to the rights of indigenous people, and one thing or another. And it seems to me the outcome document tells us it's about four sets of crimes. Uh, it's not about a lot of other terrible things that happen in the world. Uh, second of all, uh, we're going to work very hard on the side of prevention, the side of capacity building. Uh, see where that takes us, uh, and uh, see what, what uh, lessons can be learned from past genocides and, and mass atrocities. Uh, and eventually, over time, get to the mo more coercive more coercive end of this. Now, in all of this, uh, just to conclude, uh, I think it's worth remembering uh, that this really is all a historical process. And we're just at some point in this. Uh, each time you take a step forward, two steps forward, it's one step back, two steps back. Uh, Kofi Annan uh, pushed uh, on humanitarian intervention in 99-98. In, in uh, had his culminating speech to the General Assembly in September 1999, had sort of mixed reviews, uh, and retreated. Uh, you look at his uh, millennium, millennium Report the next year, uh, largely drafted by a former dean, uh, John Ruggie, it has hardly anything to say on the subject. Uh, where the Secretary General had been very bold, he then pulled back. Then the ISIS panel raised it up again, um, and uh, then it was picked up by the high-level panel, and eventually by, by, the, by the World Summit, and again, we've had two years of retreat. Uh, now we have a new Secretary General who has uh, made pledges in his campaign about trying to operationalize this, and now is very bound and determined to do so. So we move back, we move forward. But I think in the end, if you look at 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, clearly the direction is very clear. And I think there's reasons why some of the conservatives uh, in this country and, and elsewhere have been very reactive and very negative. Uh, on much of the advance of international law and organization because they see it as almost inevitable. Uh, they see it as having tremendous political momentum and potentially over time really tying the hands of the powerful in many ways, uh, really uh, embedding uh, countries in a network of law, a network of cooperation, a network of institutions that in fact is so compelling in many ways um, that there's no retreat and, and no stepping back. Uh, so there's pushback. Uh, but in the, in the end, it seems to me the direction is, is very, very clear. Uh, it's difficult, obviously, when you have institutions like the Security Council that are unable to reform themselves or to have the Assembly or others reform them. Uh, but it does seem to me, even there, it's a very, very dynamic institution that's changing both what it does and how it does it in, in many, in many uh, encouraging kinds of ways. So I hope that's enough at least to generate a little bit of conversation. And uh, I'd appreciate your comments, questions, and critiques. And I appreciate the fact that Mike worked for a while. Thank you.